that we may continue. Can you all still see my screen? Yes, right? Yes. Okay, excellent. So let's go ahead and start. So we'll go ahead and begin with our introduction. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, in comparison to the information that we presented uh, during our first meeting, uh, which provided an introductory sort of overview to the project, uh, this presentation and the items that are up for discussion uh, will be much more in depth, where we will discuss new and very exciting developments uh, and for the stakeholder group and have a chance to collaborate and brainstorm uh, on these developments. Uh, we'll also spend some time to talk about the recent publishing of our latest uh, groundbreaking report on the usage of water for oil and gas development in Webb County. We'll have a quick recap uh, on the items discussed during our last meeting. And of course, at the end of the presentation, as I mentioned, uh, we will have an open period for question and answers. Or we will answer questions, uh, receive feedback, and have a, a great discussion, hopefully. Alrighty. <clears throat> so uh, all of these, and again, all of these uh, items have been marked on our agenda, um, listed on the agenda, I should say. Uh, we should be concluding this meeting right around 2.30, uh, if not probably a little bit before, uh, depending on how long we have an, uh, our discussion period open for, um, you know, we get things going. So, uh, but Martin, by, yes. Martin, are you able to drop the agenda in the chat just so people can, can follow along? I, I'm not sure if I can right now. Let me see. Uh, if not, no worries. Just I was just wondering. Yeah, I'd have to get out of the presentation and, and interrupt it. But uh, uh, so I'll just I guess I'll just go over it real quick. So we have our we'll have our opening remarks, uh, probably less than ten minutes. Uh, we'll have the presentation. We'll, we'll talk about some of the uh, agenda items, such as the bylaws, mission statement, and uh, proposed logo designs for this uh, new watershed association that we may. Uh, create that should only last between 45 to 50 minutes probably maybe less uh, and then at the end we'll we'll have it open for question and answers from our stakeholders uh, approximately 15 to maybe 20 minutes depending on how long we go uh, and then we'll have our closing remarks uh, after that and to detail the upcoming meetings and events for this uh, group so uh, let's go ahead and move on Alrighty, so uh, just briefly, uh, for those of you who don't already know me, um, I'll introduce myself and allow, allow our uh, executive director to introduce herself as well. So again, my name is Martin Castro. I am the Watershed Science Director here at RISC, the Rio Grande International Study Center. So just briefly, for some of our new attendees, uh, prior to my appointment here at RISC, I worked as a natural resource specialist for the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, or TCEQ. I spent seven and a half years in that position, primarily working here in Laredo, and I was responsible for monitoring and conducting site inspections and investigations of surface water diversion sites uh, along the Rio Grande tributaries. Um, so with that being said, I'll, I'll go ahead and let Trisha introduce herself and just say a few words if you can. Trisha? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to start this. This is a part of our new water security program that we're developing. And one of the big components is to build a new watershed stakeholder group um, through support from the US Bureau of Reclamation. And the idea is from a stretch of the river from Eagle Pass, Piedras Negras, down to the southern tip of Webb County, that uh, we would assemble a group of people who are passionate and interested in protecting, and restoring the Rio Grande um, group. And uh, one of the major goals of this group is going to be to develop a, a river watershed restoration plan for this stretch and uh, working with clusters, the Laredo cluster, the Eagle Pass cluster, and then the Mexico cluster. So we really look forward to everybody's participation and input so that we can get to the longer term goals of this um, overall project. All right, thank you very much, Trisha, for that introduction. And uh, you, you said everything very well. Um, we'll go ahead and continue um, with our next uh, slide. So we'll recap from our first meeting, um, moving right along. Uh, so I'd like to just uh, open this presentation to recap the items that we discussed during our first meeting in August. 
This recap is mainly for newcomers, uh, new attendees for this meeting, so that as we move on to the items up for discussion for this particular meeting, uh, everyone should have a general understanding of the scope and background of this project, and so everybody's on the same page. Um, so let's go ahead and type deep. So to briefly recap uh, on the date and attendance for the first meeting, our first watershed stakeholder meeting was held virtually on August 4th of this year. Um, after the meeting concluded, we did a tally and recorded an attendance of about nearly 30 participants. Um, and that is out of a, about 48 participants that had originally registered. Uh, we had an excellent QA discussion uh, post presentation. And after the presentation, uh, I'm sorry, uh, post presentation and the feedback that we have received before during and after the presentation has really uh, guided uh, the items and format for today's meeting. So I'll go ahead and just briefly take this moment to go ahead and thank uh, everyone who made it to the first meeting, um, because without the active participation and continued interest from individuals such as yourselves, you know, these meetings would not be, simply would not be possible. Um, so again, thank you all for, for being there uh, in August. So we'll recap some of the background and scope for the San Ambrosio Santa Isabel watershed uh, project for our newcomers. Uh, again, this part will be short so that we can focus on the items up for discussion uh, for today's meeting uh, later on. So um, for those that have already seen this, you know, just uh, it'll be just a good refresher, I think, for everybody. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar with some of the terminology in this presentation, uh, I will try and explain to the best of my abilities, uh, that is, uh, what a watershed is. So that way, as we move into some of the more technical aspects of this presentation, uh, you'll have a general understanding of the concept and the work, you know, our organization has uh, undertaken. So generally speaking, a watershed is an area of land where precip precipitation collects and drains into a common uh, outlet. Usually it's a body of water, which can be a lake, a bay, an ocean, or a river. Uh, for our watershed, you know, the one that is referenced in this project, uh, this common body of water is the, the Rio Grande. So the watershed, the word watershed itself is um, sometimes used interchangeably with the terms drainage basin or, or catchment basin. But no matter what part of the country, whether you're in the United States, Mexico, or, or any other country for that matter, you are always usually located within a watershed. And that usually just depends on the scale or size of the area that you're trying to look at. Um, larger watersheds typically contain a smaller or uh, sub, sub watersheds uh, as they're known. Uh, this just depends on the outflow points. In other words, all of the land that drains into that water into that outflow point is the watershed for that outflow location. Um, so, and this is important because the stream flow and the water quality of the water body in this case, you know, the river are affected by issues and matters that are happening in the area above or upstream of the river's outflow point. Uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll briefly go over some facts and other interesting details about the San Ambrosio Santa Isabel watershed and the series of maps that we have produced. So this first map that we have produced uh, shows the extent of the project's uh, scope and the location. Um, this watershed is formerly known as the San Ambrosio Santa Isabel watershed, and it is so named for two tributaries present on the U.S. side, uh, San Ambrosio Creek and Santa Isabel Creek. Of course, being a sub-basin watershed, it is, of course, part of the much larger uh, Rio Grande Basin. <clears throat> now, this map, uh, which was produced by our organization, uh, was produced using uh, digital elevation modeling and shows the San Ambrosio Santa Isabel watershed's uh, elevation, uh, the extent of its drainage area, um, terrain, stream network order, uh, tributaries, and the main stem, of course, uh, that are present uh, within. The drainage area is approximately 5,768 square miles or roughly 14,000 square kilometers. So in terms of size, this watershed is quite extensive. <clears throat> so some watershed facts. Um, this watershed is located in a segment of the Rio Grande Basin in South Texas, which we already mentioned earlier is uh, known as the Middle Rio Grande. Uh, and this begins in the upper portion of Maverick County, uh, the watershed that is. Uh, south of Amistad Reservoir uh, by Eagle Pass and Pedros Negras, and it continues through the southwestern edge of Dimmit County and ends or terminates at the southern tip of Webb County. 
So this map just shows the cities and towns in both the US and Mexico that are located within the watershed. <clears throat> and of course, um, these uh, cities that are located within the watershed, for example, the city of Eagle Pass in Maverick County has a population of about 30,000 people. Um, the sister city of Piedras Negras in Mexico, Pahuila, has a population of approximately 150,000 people. Uh, in the southern lower portion of the watershed, uh, we have the cities of Laredo, of course, and Webb County. It has a population of 260,000 people. And uh, our sister city in Nuevo Laredo in Tamaulipas, Mexico, has a population of uh, nearly 375,000 people. So again, these are just all the communities within the watershed that we have identified, the cities, towns, and, and you name it. So here is some background on the funding for this project, uh, which comes from uh, a federal agency known as the United States Bureau of Reclamation or USBR. This federal agency is a federal agency under the Department of the Interior. Uh, and it, the USBR is primarily responsible for the management and development of many of the large federal dams and water diversion structures uh, located mainly throughout the, United, the Western United States. Uh, Hoover Dam is an example. Um, in later slides, I'll explain why the USBR uh, specifically awarded us this grant and how the funds uh, that have been allocated to this project uh, will be used uh, towards the fulfillment of the grant deliverables uh, for this project. Uh, moving on from our watershed maps, uh, I just want to give you all a brief overview of the timeline for this project and some of the phases involved. And I'll go into more detail about these phases in, in the next slide. So, of course, the project begins uh, with our project launch in, uh, in spring of this year in 2021. Um, and for uh, uh, after the project launch, this uh, encompasses phase one, which is uh, data collection, includes data collection and stakeholder interviews. This, of course, was followed by our first meeting that we held back in August of this year. Uh, phase two, we will see more collaborative planning meetings with stakeholders. Um, this could be considered one of those meetings. Um, and this, of course, is uh, followed or, 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 yeah, followed for our second public meeting uh, held today in October. Um, and then phase three, we'll see the production of a summary report uh, for stakeholders and the public. And then this will probably be followed by a third meeting uh, to be held uh, sometime in December of 2021. Uh, more meetings will also be held in, uh, of course, beginning in, in, in uh, next year in 2022. So this project timeline will be amended as we continue uh, to move forward. And finally, we will see the conclusion of this project uh, via the submittal of the final report uh, next year in the fall of 2022. I think it's uh, around September. So moving on. Um, now, the way we have approached the development and formation of this new watershed stakeholder group and watershed restoration plan that Trisha mentioned is in three phases. <clears throat> in phase one, we will plan to synthesize information from research that has been completed at the federal, state, and local levels, as well as uh, any and all relevant academic research that is pertinent to the project. Uh, following these synthesis, we will conduct one-on-one -on -one interviews with, di with diverse stakeholders, which I have already had with some of you, that represent you know, some major water use groups and uh, interests. In phase two, uh, we will host a series of meetings for stakeholders to collaboratively review the synthesized information and the list of concepts and suggestions that have been compiled from interviews. Um, the goal, of, again, of these meetings is to uh, prioritize watershed management uh, projects, and between these meetings, uh, RISC will review new uh, quantitative and qualitative data uh, that comes to light and uh, conduct relevant data and analysis to inform this process. Um, and finally, in phase three, we'll produce a summary report that is available to project participants and the public uh, that details key objectives and priority projects for the, for the watershed. Now this project and its entirety ties into our organization's uh, water security, land and climate change uh, program. Um, so when it comes to water security, you know, what does, uh, how does it tie in and what does water security mean for our community or, or what even is water security? So let me try and explain that just briefly. So when it comes to water security, you know, societies and communities can, can enjoy water security when there are when they are able to successfully manage their water resources and services to meet the needs of each dimension of water security 
which I'll show here now in the following uh, visual representation. So for domestic water security, that means the community or, uh, community or communities should be able to provide all people uh, in the community with reliable and safe drinking water. Uh, from an economic perspective, uh, this means a community should strive to sustain and support productive economies in the agriculture, uh, industry, and energy sectors. From an urban standpoint, uh, we can relate, uh, create better water management and services to support vibrant and livable communities. Environmentally, uh, this means the environmentally conscious restoration uh, approach of rivers and ecosystems. And lastly, uh, we should build for disaster related, uh, you know, water security issues, uh, resilient communities that can adapt to change uh, before and after major disasters, you know, such as floods, uh, you know, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, and, you know, uh, any kind of disaster. So before I move on, I'd like to address why this program was developed, mainly for our newcomers. In 2019, RISC held a strategy setting workshop to establish a new vision and direction for the organization, which, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> culminated with the launch of the Laredo Water Security Land and Climate Change Initiative. So the purpose of this initiative is to uh, assemble information and scientific research that identifies and prioritizes some of the necessary actions that are, uh, you know, that are needed to restore our watershed. Uh, you know, prepare our community for the, uh, you know, for the, the vagaries of climate change and develop a plan for protecting the rails environmental resources, uh, all, of course, while informing regional and local policy makers. In our original written request to the USBR, we sought to fund, we sought funding to develop a new watershed group, uh, primarily because no such entity exists within the watershed. Our organization, meanwhile, has uh, completed little to no watershed restoration planning or projects, and we <clears throat> require more substantial support for building our capacities to undertake, um, you know, these projects, uh, especially for the establishment of a new watershed stakeholder group, complete outreach to stakeholders and fund critical restoration work. You know, addi additionally, there are a few existing studies uh, from public and private entities that have fully addressed this area of the Rio Grande. And we have anticipated uh, that the geographic scale within the watershed, uh, from the maps you saw earlier, that we are currently working uh, with, is the appropriate and best level for which you know we can achieve results for our region. So just very briefly, um, some of the restoration and project objectives include uh, improved water quality and quantity, uh, you know, relationship building between stakeholders, um, increased wildlife habitat, uh, identification of historic landscapes. Um, you know, uh, a greater understanding of, of flood and, and flood and drought resilience, and many others. And from those objectives, we do hope to identify and prioritize solutions, as I have mentioned, to some of the more uh, persistent problems and future challenges that the watershed faces, uh, in order to secure the necessary funding to begin to restore the watershed. <clears throat> this will be accomplished via the drafting of a formal watershed restoration plan, which I'll uh, discuss in the next slide. So what is a watershed restoration plan? Uh, what does it entail or what does it do? Uh, so I'll just go ahead and briefly just uh, go over this. Um, a watershed restoration plan essentially is an important tool for identifying and prioritizing the work that is necessary to improve uh, water resources in a particular watershed. It provides a step-by-step -step framework um, to identify issues and outlining solutions uh, within the watershed and the resources uh, that are needed to carry them out, um, be it by financial, technical, or other means. Every watershed restoration plan tends to be unique to that particular watershed. Uh, the issues and the solutions that you, know, that you may see in a particular watershed restoration plan may include uh, you know, riparian restoration efforts, uh, channel reconstruction, uh, stream restoration, uh, landscape restoration, uh, natural enhancements, and of course, many others. <clears throat> For the majority of watershed restoration plans, um, the primary goals usually tend to focus on, you know, the water quality perspective, um, primarily by reducing non-source point pollutants, non-point source pollutants, excuse me, um, which usually like its examples include uh, excess sediment, uh, nutrients, and or high temperatures. But each watershed restoration plan also has the opportunity to express unique concerns or conservation goals uh, for that particular watershed. And, and that can only be done, again, through strong 
stakeholder collaboration and feedback. As I mentioned previously, uh, developing a watershed restoration plan uh, requires the input of multiple stakeholders from across the watershed. Uh, these stakeholders, you know, people such as yourselves, are the ones who will guide restoration plan development through input and collaboration, and to a certain extent, see that stakeholder interests are also covered within uh, the plan. Uh, so by encouraging involvement uh, from all watershed stakeholders, a watershed restoration plan can successfully guide this uh, water resource work you know, that will maximize uh, public benefit by focusing efforts on areas of highest interest need, um, you know, the greatest areas with, that have the greatest potential benefit and allowing resource funding, of course, to be used more uh, efficiently. So that wraps up for our recap. Um, I'll go ahead and move on now from recapping uh, the information from the first meeting uh, to provide, uh, to discuss, I'm sorry, the items on the agenda for the watershed um, project. <clears throat> now, so these agenda items and the materials in which they are presented uh, will, were provided last week in a formal newsletter. Um, so I'm hopeful that people have had a chance to review these. Um, so up for agenda, uh, beginning uh, the top bullet is the proposal of the formal name for the Watershed Association, um, the proposed association uh, bylaws uh, for the association, uh, proposed mission and vision statement for the association, and lastly, uh, some logos that we have uh, drafted uh, that we'd like to, to show you all. Now, before I continue, I, I do want to make something very perfectly clear. And that is all the documentation that has been shared with this group uh, from the bylaws, mission statement, uh, logos, all of this documentation, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, provisional, meaning that there is a strong possibility, depending on the feedback that we received today, for example, that these items and the ideas behind them may be amended or changed uh, you know, tomorrow or next week. And that is, of course, dependent on what we believe is best for risk and the grant deliverables that we were required to fulfill from uh, the USBR. So just please keep that in mind moving forward. Um, nothing is set in stone yet, but we will discuss it and, and have, an, uh, you know, have this meeting uh, to collaborate and maybe brainstorm for some of these items. So for starters, we'll have, we have proposed in our bylaws that the association be formally known as the San Ambrosio Santa Isabel Watershed uh, Association, uh, taken from the very watershed in which this project is named after. Uh, the acronym is shown below. And now, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the presentation, all these again, all these agenda items will be up for discussion. So please kindly hold off and proposing new names for now. Uh, everyone will have their chance to speak soon, I promise. Uh, so uh, you know, just be patient with us and we'll, we'll get to this soon. So the bylaws that I have drafted for the creation of, for the potential creation of a new watershed uh, association, uh, they've been formulated in a way that uh, the structure of this association will function as a uh, nonprofit subsidiary organization of risk. Uh, risk, of course, being the parent company. Now I can foresee that this will probably be the most heavily debated and discussed part of today's meeting. Um, Internally, we have had many discussions with our consultants on how to best formulate the watershed stakeholder group itself. Uh, initially, we proposed forming this association under risk as its own nonprofit subsidiary, as you see here. However, I do want to mention that there is also a strong possibility uh, that we may also not pursue this route uh, for several reasons. But of course, we'll be happy to discuss this at the end of the presentation. Now, I won't go uh, over the entire document uh, as it is quite extensive, but on the right, you will see what is typical of such documentation uh, when it comes to uh, 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 nonprofit bylaws. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is all have been included in, the, in, the, in, in this document and, and everything is up for review and the link I had sent uh, last week. If anyone would like a copy of these documents, um, we will be more happy to share them and we can uh, uh, get together after the meeting to provide those to you all. <clears throat> uh, thirdly, I have also drafted a mission statement for the association and it details the purpose, uh, scope, and the constituents involved 
Um, and similar to the mission statement, um, a vision statement that I have also drafted, uh, which is simple, I've also drafted a vision statement is, and this is simply an inspirational sort of uh, uh, affirmation for the association with a set goal and the hope that we can create an idealistic future for the association. Um, so for the, again, for the purposes of keeping time, I won't go over these in detail, but again, we're going to discuss all this at the end of the presentation. Uh, that is why I've sort of tried to keep time for now so that we can have a lot more time to discuss uh, at the end. Alrighty, so finally, and this is perhaps my favorite part of all the agenda items that are up for discussion, uh, which are the logos that we have proposed for this, uh, for the association. Um, we worked with a graphic designer uh, to come up with several variations of this logo, um, specifically for today's meeting. Now, I have not yet come up with a way in which we will choose the best logo for to represent this group or the association. But again, we'll discuss this at the end of the presentation. Uh, so just please, you know, uh, and we can, I'll, I'll show this to you all at the end as well, if you'd like to go, me to go back and, and see something in particular. Uh, again, all of this has been shared uh, prior to this meeting. So uh, if you all need uh, new the, the links to it, we will happy to share this with you all at the end. <clears throat> uh, before we conclude uh, and open this meeting up for discussion, because uh, we're getting close, uh, we'd like to provide you all with just a brief overview of the latest project we recently completed, um, which uh, we just, I guess, uh, basically internally call it the Rockefeller Oil and Gas Project and Report. And again, this all, of course, ties into RISC's uh, growing water security program so that we believe it's appropriate to discuss uh, during this meeting. <clears throat> so as part of the grant deliverables uh, for the Laredo Water Security Land and Climate Change uh, Program uh, grant that we received from the Rockefeller Family Fund er, earlier this month, we officially published and released our latest report, uh, which is, uh, details a 10-year analysis on the usage and disposal of water for oil and gas development in Webb County, Texas, which of course is titled uh, The Thirst for Water in South Texas, a report on the usage and disposal of water for oil and gas development in Webb County, Texas. This first of its kind report was the culmination of a months long effort uh, we undertook to document and understand how freshwater resources have been primarily from water from the Rio Grande have been used for oil and gas development in Webb County uh, over the past decade. Additionally, the report also documents uh, where and how wastewater byproducts from fracking, more commonly referred to as produced water, uh, have been disposed of by industry operators in Webb County. And of course, the goal of, of, of publishing this report is uh, we'd like to disclose to the public and to our state legislators and regulators uh, the true cost of oil and gas development as it relates to the usage of, and disposal of water uh, from the Rio Grande in Webb County. Uh, because uh, to our understanding, no, nothing like this has ever been published before in our region. Um, a lot of the academic literature that you may see is usually just, um, and you'll see why uh, we say it's first of its kind. A lot of the academic literature uh, in our research that we found is usually tend to only sort of lean on uh, estimates. You know, it's hard to quantify uh, data, especially when you're working with uh, large amounts. So this report is different in that we've quantified uh, nearly all the data used in this report. So there's no estimates. This is, these are all true uh, numbers that we uh, received from uh, various sources, which I'll detail in the next couple of slides. So how was this report produced? Producing this report required considerable efforts across several disciplines, including data analysis, spatial analysis, uh, investigative research, and many hours of literature review, of course. <clears throat> and so the data for this report was primarily sourced from two uh, uh, regulatory agencies here in Texas, uh, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, or TCEQ, and the Railroad Commission of Texas. Much of the data, for example, uh, had to be acquired through the filing of public information requests, or PIRs. As some people may be familiar with, with this, uh, there are also commonly known as Freedom, from, Freedom of Information Act requests, which are is, they're essentially the same. Additionally, we also had a tremendous amount of work. We did a tremendous amount of work pouring over uh, public database uh, searches and in, uh, inquiries to acquire much of the data used in this report. 
So this report primarily concerns two areas that we have studied um, and we have focused our research on, and, and that is uh, the usage of water from the Rio Grande for oil and gas development in Webb County, how much has been used, where it's been used, and uh, you know what what sort of uh, what what did, what did we learn throughout this investigation? And secondly, uh, the disposal of water that has been that has uh, resulted from oil and gas development in, in Webb County, similar to you know to to uh, the usage. You know, we quantified uh, the amounts of who who and where and why these uh, companies were uh, you know uh, using and disposing of this of this water in Webb County. And compiling this information was, of course, no easy task. Um, we retrieved and analyzed data throughout a 10-year period, uh, beginning in January 1st, uh, 2010, uh, to last year, December 31st of 2020. And so we've organized this information in a series of graphs, uh, charts, uh, and other figures in a manner that we believe has been uh, most uh, easily accessible for the public uh, to understand. Um, if you have not already read the report, you know, this report is up on our website, uh, www.risk.org, under our publications tab. Um, if you all like for me to send you all a uh, personal copy, as I'd be more than happy to do that uh, after our presentation. And so this report, um, I'm sorry. So some of the report uh, facts and findings that we uncovered during our research and investigation, um, you know, this, uh, it's been interesting to say the least uh, what we've discovered. So I'll briefly just go over some of the quick facts. Um, so overall, in a 10 year period from 2010 to 2020, um, several oil and gas operators in Webb County uh, diverted approximately 19.2 billion gallons, that's billion with a B, of surface water from the Rio Grande for oil and gas development. This was data that came straight from uh, oil and gas operators themselves that was reported to uh, state regulator, uh, the TCEQ that was then provided to us. Additionally, uh, we uh, uncovered that uh, oil and gas operators in Webb County also disposed of over 1.79 billion gallons of highly hazardous produced water, uh, again, a byproduct from oil and gas development, into various disposable sites uh, across Webb County. That came from the Railroad Commission uh, from that was reported from operators. And lastly, um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the previous slide, but throughout our research and investigation, we also encountered some difficulties in not only accessing this data, but some inconsistencies that we found as well, um, where some of the data was either incomplete or contained missing operator records. But I can answer more of those questions at the end of the presentation. Um, and to summarize, uh, we made a list of what we believe are sound recommendations uh, to state regulators uh, concerning the data and some of the discrepancies that we had uncovered in this report. Um, in the essence of keeping time, I won't go over these in this slide, uh, but you can certainly read more about them in the report that is up on our website. But just briefly, you know, uh, we want to make a lot of this data for the purposes of transparency, um, you know, available for the public so that no one has to file a public information request just to obtain it uh, because some of the one of the regulators already does this for for other areas of the state um maybe perhaps changing some of the rules so uh regarding the reporting of this uh of this usage and you know and ask some of the, our regulators to investigate why some of these discrepancies were present you know why were some of these uh, records not uh, missing were missing or incomplete so again all of this is detailed in our report so please if you have a chance i highly recommend uh you all uh, read it uh, since publishing this report, uh, we are happy to report uh, that we have also been featured in various media outlets. Um, our report was featured, I believe, two weeks ago in an online article by Sandra Sanchez from Border Reports. And I personally interviewed on three separate occasions for other uh, various media outlets. Um, I don't have a screenshot of my interview with Univision. I promise I did interview. I just I couldn't find a link to, to the video. But so that was an interesting, uh, uh, those, those were all interesting interviews. And I, I thank all the, uh, the people who made them possible, the anchors and the reporters. Uh, we had some great discussions and it certainly brought a lot of attention to this report. So finally, I'll close out this presentation with, uh, as I did during our first meeting, to remind you all why this work, not just the report I just discussed, but of course the Watershed Project itself and why it's important. 
Um, you know, for starters, water is a critical resource for human health, uh, economic growth, and agricultural uh, productivity. And secondly, uh, when we talked about water security in, earlier in the presentation, we talked about how water security can be only achieved when there's enough water for everyone in the region and the water supply is not at risk of uh, disappearing or at risk of contamination. The work our organization will be doing will be done in such a way that we will be disseminating the information and feedback from you, the stakeholders and the public to identify some of the more persistent problems on watershed faces. Uh, because of course, securing our water will be essential to ensure a better future for our, uh, generations to come. And so to conclude, you know, we at risk foresee a future where we have established uh, greater water security for Laredo and surrounding communities, of course. As we pr previously mentioned, uh, we are currently in the process of creating uh, our watershed stakeholder group and formulating this uh, watershed restoration plan in order to propose solutions to some of the uh, current problems the watershed is facing. And so eventually we foresee being able to secure funding to begin restoring the watershed. And just briefly, real quick, uh, just a call to action, you know, how you can help is uh, become a donating member for risk, spread the word to your coworkers, family, friends, you know, teachers, enthusiasts, anyone who, and everyone who wants to be a part of this. Um, and please take our survey uh, for the watershed project. Um, it will more accurately give you a better understanding of exactly the kind of input we're seeking and, and whether or not you'd like to participate um, and, and, and donate your time for this for this new endeavor from risk. And this is our last slide before we open our, uh, our uh, period for uh, question and answers. Uh, there's an upcoming, there will be an upcoming meeting in November 2021. Uh, as Trisha mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, we are sort of uh, have uh, uh, learned that we will probably, because of the size of this watershed, the, the uh, amount of people that uh, we've identified in it, uh, it's probably better for us to focus on, on certain groups uh, uh, separately so that uh, it's, it's easier for us to concentrate our work. So in November, we'll be hosting a meeting for our Mexican stakeholders in the watershed. Uh, the date, of course, is to be decided. In December, we'll, meet, we'll reconvene again uh, uh, for our U.S. stakeholders. The date will also be uh, decided. So uh, just please keep an eye on that for our newsletters. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll be meeting again soon. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, I'll go ahead and open it up for question and answers and discussion and collaboration. Um, please, uh, we will take questions and answers uh, one at a time. Uh, We'll have enough time to provide uh, everyone with a chance to speak. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the presentation so that I can see everyone, um, and we can open it up for a Q and A. Okay, Martin, uh, can you hear me? This is Memo Benavides. Yes, Mr. Benavides. Go ahead. Uh, I I had some observations if if I could. Um, and I will be getting off here, so I hope you'll bear with me as being the first one to, you know, volunteer to to speak. But um, there's at least one uh, major component, Martin, that has been uh, completely left out of this uh, the thinking this process so far, and that is the fact that Al that share the river with us, the Rio Grande Valley, to be more. Mr. Benavides, you're, you're kind of cutting in and out. Uh, would you mind repeating that one more time? I think you're, I think you're having connection issues. Mr. Benavides, can you still hear me? Uh, you're having some connection Those issues, Mr. Benavides? Okay. Let me, is that any better? Hello? A, a little bit. It's still a little hey, scratch. Yeah. Is that any better? Yes. Okay. It's a little scratchy. I, I, well, uh, I'll there try we and get to see. Okay. Um, as I uh, started to say, uh, 
there is a, a big component here, Martin, that I don't think is part or has been as long as I've been listening uh, to this whole, uh, you know, to this whole puzzle. Um, our neighbors to the south, and I, I refer to them generally as the Rio Grande Valley, um, share the river with us. Uh, they, they are not, have not been included in, in this discussion. And, you know, according to the maps that I saw, they're, they're not going to be included. But I think it's very important to remember, to keep firmly in mind, that uh, the Rio Grande Valley uses uh, a lot of the river. In other words, yeah, they are the, the primary beneficiaries, as far as I can see, of, of the flow of the river. Uh, they would be the primary uh, benefactors of any efforts that help uh, improve, whether it be the flow or the quality or both of the Rio Grande flow. And uh, right. I'm wondering if any thought has been given to that. So to answer your question, Mr. Benavides, yes, it has. Um, the, the, the thing is, is that the funding that has been allocated to risk for this project is only for the the project scope and location that I show that I showed uh, in these maps. Um, so, yes, I agree that our neighbors down south in the valley should be included. Um, however, um, it's important to also remember that um, we're we're only allowed to allocate the funds that have been allocated for this project are only within the project scope uh, for this uh, for this uh, watershed. So. Um, and even then, it's it's even the size of this watershed alone is it makes um, collaborating with stakeholders uh, uh, not difficult. But it's it's already you know large enough for for one organization. Um, if I had if if risk you know we uh, if we were larger and maybe had more resources, um, maybe we could tackle on a project of that size where we could include stakeholders uh, uh, throughout. Uh, the lower Rio Grande Valley, but for now, you know, perhaps in the next, you know, uh, if we decide to go bigger in the next round of funding, maybe we can uh, collaborate with our stakeholders uh, from our neighbors down south. So I hope that answered your question. I see uh, Virginia, uh, go ahead and, and, and uh, I'll take it to you. Yeah, just to add a little more. My name is Virginia Palacios, and I helped to write the grant proposal to U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Um, and so when I was doing research for the proposal and putting this together, um, what I found was that there is an existing watershed stakeholder group that covers sort of the downstream portion from Laredo through the Rio Grande Valley. And so what was missing really was this upstream component, which is what this, this project is going to look at is you know, what happens before you get to Laredo and what happens along that, that part of the river that eventually affects Laredo. And so it's a good point, Memo. Um, and that's kind of the reason why we're, we're focusing on the upstream portion instead of the downstream is because the, the downstream is really are already covered by other watershed stakeholder groups. And this is where the gap was. Martin. You know, I, I appreciate that. And, and I understand that. Uh, Virginia, are you aware of the, the the way the state has been segmented uh, for purposes of uh, water needs uh, by the state. Um, in, in our particular area, we fall into region M, as in Manny. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we are lumped in uh, with, with the Rio Grande Valley as far as water needs and I used to serve on a committee on that Region M Water Planning Committee, and uh, the the Rio Grande interests were clearly dominant. They they were the ones that led discussions, and uh, you know uh, they kind of claimed the river uh, not to themselves, but they they made it very clear. Uh, that uh, you know their efforts and their water demands from the Rio Grande are are dominant, are superior, or whatever. And so, you know that's why I I, I continue to urge that 
even though this, this project appears to be uh, specific to our area and the upper Rio Grande from here, that uh, that, uh, you know, that demand on the water is going to be uh, consumed, uh, whether we protect it or not on, you know, on our upper end. But okay. so anyway, that, no. that was, that was my point. No, no problem, Mr. Benavides and Virginia. Thank you for for adding to that of what I had said earlier. Uh, I'll now let it, uh, Victor, Mr. Victor Wong, go ahead and ask um, a question. Go ahead, Victor. Uh, yes, Martin. Thank you. And uh, and to answer Mr. Benavides' question, there is a group that is called the Lower Rio, Rio Grande Water Quality Initiative that also it's is working to engage stakeholders on the U.S. and Mexican side to identify any watershed priority issues. And its goal is to reach a consensus. And it's working with Mexican entities such as Conagua, SILA, and IBWC to engage stakeholders and identify any issues that are impacting the watershed in the lower Rio Grande Valley. So this is this effort is ongoing. Uh, and if you like, Mr. Benavides, I can send you more information about the Lower Rio Grande Water Quality Initiative. They actually have quarterly meetings with stakeholders to identify any issues and ongoing efforts in that area. Yes, so Victor is uh, um, uh, uh, was my coworker at TCEQ at my time there. So yes, he, he has put a lot of work into this. Thank you, Victor, for for uh, clarifying. That's that. very good to hear. Um, All righty, Mr. Benavides, uh, it looks like you're still having some audio issues. Um, I see here a uh, Trisha. You have your hand up. Also, you wanted to mention something. Yes, uh, uh, Memo. I think that's a, a a really good point that you make, and we're in a very interesting spot geographically, right? So we are sandwiched between the big, massive consumers of Rio Grande water downstream, but we are also at the mercy of the suppliers of water upstream. And last meeting, Tom Miller, um, you know, um, as you recommended that we involve Rio Grande Valley people into this group, Tom Miller had really suggested that we involve people from the Conchos River Basin into this call as well, since we're like sandwiched in the middle of these big uh, uh, users and then suppliers. Um, and so I think uh, we definitely want to move toward that. Um, we want to get our group formed first um, and, 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 and established and grounded in terms of its mission. And then, and then um, I think within our group, we want to talk with USBR if we can get another round, because I think logically we need to include Zapata County into, into this group where it's Maverick, Webb, Zapata as like our immediate working group and then establish ourselves. And then with time, be able to have these important discussions and exchanges with these upstream uh, key suppliers and then the big downstream users as well. I just, just wanted to mention that. No, thank you, Tricia. Go ahead, Mr. Benavides. No, I, I really don't have anything to add. Um, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, you know, we're looking at, you know, up above us and down below us because uh, I, I realize and I, I'm sensitive to the fact that the, the grant is, uh, applies specifically just to our particular area, but, and I wish it were that simple, but, um, you know, people above us and people below us, they have a lot to do with, you know, what, what would, what good are our efforts if uh, someone else is going to take full advantage and not be part of the process and be part of the, the con you know, contributions. Right, right. Well, well that's noted, noted, Mr. Benavides. We will, uh, you know, this is why we're having these meetings to, to, to receive this type of feedback. I have a question in the chat. Uh, I think this, Trisha, this is for you. This is from uh, Quinn. Uh, Quinn, if you want to go ahead and just introduce yourself and, and state uh, where you're from and, and, and your and your role. Sure, guys. My name is Quinn McCauley. I'm a conservation finance director with Texas Water Trade. We uh, try to roll out market mechanisms to increase the efficient allocation of water across the state. Uh, we work in Galveston Bay. Trying to ramp up a project in Matagorda. I come from 
Corpus Christi. And, and so it's close to the valley, but not out quite as far as you guys. We, we do some work in the Trans-Pecos, uh, trying to restore degraded conditions on the Pecos River. So we, we generally have an interest in West Texas and we're um, interested in the possibility of moving further down closer to you guys. So I'm really pleased to be invited um, to this group. And, and I was just kind of listening to this and, and looking at it through the lens of maybe where we could plug in. And when Tricia had mentioned the potential for um, flow-based restoration, it, uh, it really got my attention. So I didn't know if that was in the in this scope of this particular project or if it's separate. And then if you have location in mind or mapped that uh, you'd be willing to share. Very quickly, Quinn. Um, so environmental flows are not a factor. They're not a factor. They're not on the radar screen. They're not thought about. They're not. <laughs> they're not worked into like the future planning or projections for the Rio Grande, unfortunately. Um, and I believe that that is something that our group uh, could and should have a discussion on at some point and what environmental flows are are that right now all of the water rights for the river go for very specific things like agriculture uh, municipalities uh industry but there's nothing that there are no water rights if you will allocated for uh just to to provide for good aquatic habitat for species and so the rio grande um um, data or research has shown more than 80% of the time is flowing below subsistence and subsistence is the level and above that you want for very good healthy aquatic habitat uh, for species and aquatic life and more than 80% of the time we're below that and I think uh, the mentality around the Rio Grande has been very very uh, just black and white you know uh, cities uh, industry whatever, but it doesn't think of the Rio Grande as an entity, as a system, as a healthy living organism. And so I do think, Quinn, that this is sort of a new area for our region that is just, and at, even at the TCEQ water master level, this is not something that they're really plugged into necessarily. Um, and so I think it's a good idea um, to have this as, as, you know, as a topic of discussion, or it might become a priority of ours, who knows what, when we go to uh, build our restoration list of priorities for our plan. So at this time, uh, this is a very new concept, I would say, for this stretch of this particular river. Alrighty, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so continue our discussion. I'm just monitoring the chat to see if anyone had any other questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to speak up. Uh, if not, I can pull, I can just uh, sort of ask some questions freely to the audience and see if anyone has anything to say. Um, I see Eric has his- this, yes, this is Eric Avery and San Ignacio. And yes, you know, Avery. I asked that question about human right, you know, is water a human right? And that was addressed maybe before all people got on this. Uh, but uh, Memo's point about the downriver, I mean, I'm at the edge of Webb County and San Ignacio's water and Zapata's water is really fragile right now. And I would like to stay in the stakeholder meetings even though I'm not a stakeholder in your funded group. Because like Memo, I would like to continue to advocate for, you know, the, what's, you know, just downriver from you. And I'm a physician retired. When I worked in Africa in huge refugee camps, everything in my camp, when the rains came, went to the camp down below us. And so uh, I'm very close to the bottom of your, of your uh, of your group, and I would like to stay in and advocate for this uh, larger sort of uh, uh, fo larger. Uh, you know, anyway, that's my point. <laughs> and I want to make art to raise money for you know what you're doing, and I think I know how to do it, and so I want to stay in to be a fundraiser for your project. Well, for just that reason alone, Eric, then you can stay. You got it. Okay. Permission, <laughs> permission granted. Okay. 
Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Avery, uh, for, for yes, for your statement. Certainly, uh, you know, we'd be happy to have you here in our, in our meetings. Um, and like I said, you know, it's important to have equal representation uh, as the Bureau uh, states, yeah. you know, they'd like to have, they would like to see a diverse group of stakeholders uh, for this project. And diverse, of course, being uh, stakeholders from all walks of life, um, you know, wildlife enthusiasts, community leaders, business interests, landowners, of course, being very important, uh, government officials from municipal, from local, uh, you know, state and federal uh, uh, um, places. So yes, you know, certainly feel free to keep uh, chiming in and being a part of this. Uh, I did want to mention uh, briefly, um, did anyone have any sort of um, thoughts or opinions on how this stakeholder group should be formulated. Uh, I know I did mention, you know, that we, um, well, we were looking at possibly, you know, forming this as a nonprofit subsidiary of risk, but there is also a possibility that we may not pursue that route because, uh, and I'll explain why, and I, had, I know I mentioned this in the presentation, I was going to mention this, um, forming a nonprofit subsidiary uh, for uh, an organization uh, would entail a tremendous amount of work on, on my part and, 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 and risk. It's not something that, you know, we're not trying to avoid doing. It's just that we'd like to make sure that what we're doing, uh, whether we structure it formally or in a much more um, simpler way, is, is going to be the best way for this uh, new uh, stakeholder group. So uh, understand, you know, that that would entail also uh, acquiring, you know, its own possibly acquiring its own separate 501c3, if that's possible, or, you know, you know, figuring out how we would fund this new group. So it's all dependent, you know, the Bureau has left this very much uh, open for us to sort of form it as uh, we believe is best, uh, sort of like kind of like an, uh, a clean slate, so to speak. Um, so where we can, you know, if they believe we've done, we've, we've, uh, we've, we've done this, um, you know, in a, in a manner that's best for this organization, for this uh, organization, that they will, you know, allow us to secure for the next round of funding. So I, I don't know if anybody had any thoughts on that. Um, or any, any opposed, any opposing uh, sort of uh, opinion? No. Mr. Benavides? Sorry to bother you again. Uh, I did oh, want to no make problem. a I, I guess maybe maybe I'm getting it wrong, but I guess the name, I guess I felt like it, based on the conversation we just had, it's a little misleading uh, that we're talking about the Santa Isabel drainage, but we really are talking about the Rio Grande. So right. for whatever it's worth, I think, uh, you know. Yeah, so... The, the watershed itself, uh, the, so I'll give you some technical information. Uh, wa the watersheds, uh, in, in, at least in the U.S., uh, they're formally classified uh, by what, they're, what are called hydrologic unit codes by the United States uh, Geological Survey, um, a f another federal agency. Um, we, you know, they have usually designated these numbers uh, depending on the size and scope of the watershed, be it, whether it's a a part of a large basin as and as you go down uh work your way down towards a smaller and smaller uh sort of uh, scope uh these numbers get larger and larger uh this uh, particular watershed uh has an eight digit uh huc hydrologic unit code um which is a very long number that is you know uh, i could I, I will will show it or, and probably use it in, in more do in future documentation but formally, you know, I guess we'd like to call it this sort of uh, th this name because it refers to uh, again the two um, the two uh, tributaries uh, that are present in the watershed, uh, San Ambrosio Creek and Santa Isabel Creek on the U.S. side. Um, but it is, of course, a binational watershed that um, includes both countries. Uh, and again, the, the, drainage, uh, the drainage area is also very extensive. Uh, so that was just a proposal. I mean, certainly I think if you all or Mr. Benavides, if, if everyone has a, a sort of a different a sort of choice for this name or proposal, please, you know, you can speak now or, or we can get in touch after and, and we can certainly uh, put this up for discussion and proposal for the next uh, meeting. 
in December. The, the last thing I wanted to comment is that I just felt like we needed to have an independent organization that would be just a U.S. form of, of this company. And if Mexico creates one, that's great. And we can try to work with them. But uh, I don't think that we need to get caught up in what is happening independently in Mexico. I think, on the contrary, we need to be proactive and figure out either how we're going to stimulate our state or our national government to get involved with the Republic of Mexico to make the necessary changes so we can really sustain water quality. Because I believe that's really the more critical uh, in your face event that exists today versus volume, you know. Uh, we currently are living, you know, in a community uh, that should have a full time, you know, boil notice because we're not, e we're not, you know, ingesting proper water, whether it's right. drinking or washing or whatever. And so uh, those are the things that I'd like to advocate for something that I've always felt that needs to be addressed sooner than later. And what the conversation we're having today is actually the conversation that's been happening for the last couple of weeks with uh, all the farmers out of Colorado and all the waters coming out of the Rockies, which include the waters coming to the Rio Grande. And right. the fact that, you know, we're in the diminishing, re you know, reserves and, you know, we, people that are still utilizing more than their allotted shares for different things. And so therefore, we're just creating a burden that at some point we're not going to be able to sustain. And so we need to get right. involved. Well, that's very true, Mr. Menavides. You know, and that all again ties into what our water security program uh, entails, uh, you know, to secure enough, uh, you know, uh, to sustain enough, uh, you know, this, that our, uh, we should be able to sustain, uh, you know, uh, have enough drinking water for our community and, and have a clean of, of drinking water as well. Yeah, no, that all ties in and, and very much noted uh, as part of your uh, uh, feedback, Mr. Benavides. Thank you very much. Um, I see a, uh, Virginia had another sort of comment in the chat. Uh, Virginia, I don't know if you just want to reiterate what you mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, sure. We were talking before about, you know, the inclusion of the Rio Grande Valley um, and just downstream affected stakeholders in this discussion. And I, I just wanted to say, yeah, I think we should always be considering what happens downstream because we're all connected, right? You know, it's not like the water flows stop and end at the scope of this project. Um, I, I think that we should remain focused on the scope of the project um, that we've already set out, which is that eight digit HUC code. Um, you know, that was part of this USBR grant. But um, I think, you know, th there's nothing telling us that we can't think about more broadly what happens downstream after we set our goals for this particular watershed. Um, and I'm, I'm finding uh, some of the USGS data so that y'all can kind of explore what's available online and better understand that system of hydrologic unit codes from the USGS. Thank you, Virginia. No, that's, uh, uh, you know, thank you for mentioning that. Um, did you all have, think, a, go ahead, Mr. Martin, Benavides. I'm going to be getting off uh, pretty quick, but just getting back to the idea of what kind of entity, I, I would suggest that a nonprofit, which maybe will be an arm of, of the, you know, the Mata, the major, uh, entity would probably best suit, uh, this, this project. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, there will be more efforts to uh, to get uh, grants and things of that nature. And from my experience, I've seen that nonprofits are more likely to uh, be looked favorably upon by, you know, those that are granting, uh, that are giving grants. So, uh, you know, in whatever form, I, I would advocate forming a nonprofit specifically for this uh, this project. Okay, Mr. Benavides. Well, thank you for that feedback. Uh, again, we're all, you know, we're recording this meeting just for, for this, you know, because this is all extremely valuable information that we we need for this uh, for this group. Uh, because again, without it, we would sort of uh, lose our sense of direction to say the least. Um, I, I did want to bring up just briefly, uh, I know about the logo real quick. Um, I can show it to you all now, but uh, 
I guess finishing uh, finishing the meeting, uh, do you all sort of want me to vote on, we all take a vote, I can create a survey and we can take a tally of the number one sort of design for this, uh, for logo. Do you all agree with that? Or would you all like to just sort of see them, see it now? And um, I don't know what you all, what you all uh, would prefer. Well, we're happy to work with you all. Are we, uh, were we ready, do you think, Martin, or the group to look at the logo as uh, the name of this association? How do y'all feel about the name of this association and, and already getting a logo to start branding it so that uh, we can move forward knowing that this is work coming out of this group? I just had one more comment about the idea of creating a subsidiary or a separate 501c3. I guess part of me is thinking, you know, it, it, if you can avoid creating another organization or entity, that's probably the better thing to do um, since risk already has its 501c3. And I guess I'm wondering, can this just be a project of risk? Does it need to be a quote unquote subsidiary? Is it necessary for it to be a whole other organization? Right. Uh, Virginia, I think I see uh, Mr. Ruben Soto has a question. I think you can talk more about that. Ruben, is, um, you want to just go ahead and introduce yourself and state who you are? Uh, yes, uh, Ruben Soto Jr., CPA for risk. And uh, so I think I could address that. We looked into this forming a subsidiary. And as you all know, you noted, you know, it will incur additional cost of which we don't have funding for. So currently we have a specific grant allocated for these types of the project that we're talking about that Martin's talking and discussing right now. And to form a new organization to, and there's just the cost of starting a 501c3 legal and counting and, and then uh, operating costs will have to be generated as well. So that's something we could look at down the road, you know, as an avenue to uh, create more funding opportunities. And if we have great funding opportunities that will fund not only the project itself, but overhead, salaries, and everything that goes along with it, then we'll definitely consider that. But right now, the watershed issue is one of the, uh, of the main uh, uh, projects for risk. I mean, that's part of our mission statement to protect the watershed. And so I think right now, the most efficient way of handling this is handling, handling it through risk. If that makes sense. No, thank you, Ruben, for, for that input. Um, again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, remember what I said earlier that, you know, yes, we drafted these documents for review or for, uh, you know, for your reading pleasure to so that you all can uh, see what we've done since our last meeting. Uh, again, there's been a lot of behind the scenes work uh, on my part and Treasure's part as well to, to sort of have this information uh, to be presented during this meeting. But again, you know, based on the feedback that we received today, you know, how the best would we approach this and, and continue to formulate uh, this group, which has never been, you know, nothing like this has ever been done before for this area. Uh, and so again, it's very, you know, a likelihood that, you know, we may not, uh, all the work that I did is, is not saying, you know, we have to start from square one. However, we can sort of amend and change some of the documentation to not be sort of so formal. Uh, for risk, but sort of have it as uh, maybe like a, um, a committee or something that risk and oversee and, and help guide and steer the, the, the sort of overall um, goals for this project. Uh, because yeah, forming that would be, would be very difficult indeed, but not to take away from the work that's already been done. Certainly we want to keep, um, you know, the, the uh, vision there, so. Um, let's see here. I'm just monitoring the chat real quick. Uh, looks like we have uh, Miss Melissa Cigarroa. Um, Melissa, I don't know if you want to come on and just sort of state something very quick. Uh, if you'd like to uh, briefly state who you are and, and, and your role. Sure. So I do serve as the board president for um, risk. Um, but I do agree that it would be, it falls right now, the formation of this group within the scope of RISC's mission. And so if the group starts out under the um, 501c3 of RISC, and then in the future as it develops, if it does become too big and it just, its scope expands past RISC's capacity, then it has a stronger position to spin off as a 501c3 on its own. 
I feel like trying to do that now will prevent its formation from taking off. And that's the key goal right now is to get this group launched off the ground, get it going. And um, in the future, if it makes sense to become its own entity, then I think risk can support it. And certainly, um, you know, we have the background to be able to figure out that 501c3 status. But right now, I, I just agree it should remain under risks. Um, under risks umbrella. Okay. Oh, thank you, Melissa, for that input. Um, so it sounds like I guess that we have sort of a, a consensus, maybe, uh, to to sort of keep this, uh, you know, not as a subsidiary, but maybe something a little bit more uh, not informal. I don't want to use that word, but uh, less structured, but still keeping with the vision and mission of of, of risk. Um, I wanted to just ask real quick uh, if we wanted to talk about some sort of leadership for the group. Uh, if not today, we can do it at the next meeting. But um, we can send out some some uh, some uh, sort of uh, ideas to our stakeholders, to yourselves on, on who should be, I think, a representative. Um, of course, I am overseeing the project, uh, and uh, uh, you know, does anyone have any suggestions on how we should uh, sort of oversee this? I think Lisa um, has her hand up. Yes. So I actually, um, Martin, before that, I think the most important um, part of, of the formation of this group is that mission statement and vision statement. And it's usually kind of a time consuming process. So if you will send that information, that language to each member and have a comment period and, um, and, and that way there can be contributions or at least an understanding of what exactly that mission and vision statement are. Um, I think that's gonna be the best place to start. And I would, um, you know, I would just hold off on maybe the leadership discussion until the next meeting after people have a better understanding of, of, of what this scope entails and, and we think about it a little bit. Okay, great I suggestion, would, Melissa. I would also suggest that uh, uh, in conjunction with sending out that information, which I think is a good idea, we send out a list of the, the members, the people that are on the call, and perhaps, you know, if they want to include a title or not, but at least I, I'm not sure exactly who, who all is on the call. I know Mr. C.Y. Benavides asked for, for that roll call, and we weren't able to get it, and I think it would be a good idea to you know, find out exactly who, you know, who's been invited and who uh, appears to be ready to participate. So uh, please, if you can send out a, a list of, of the people that are involved, and then I think we can uh, take a closer look or uh, further consider leadership. Well, sounds like an excellent suggestion. Uh, I will certainly uh, get on that after, uh, you know, concluding today's meeting. Uh, an open period for uh, comments sounds like an excellent uh, idea, I, and I agree with that. I think we can, uh, we can that can be managed. So I will send out all the documentation again with new with uh, with links. Um, there sh there should be already they should already be set up for uh, uh, commenting already um, again. So we will we will get to that soon. Um, let's see here. Marce, did you have, Marcella, did you have a, uh, another question? I saw you had your hand up earlier. Go ahead. Could you state your name and where, uh, where you're from? Sure. Hi. Hello, everyone. Sorry I was late. I'm Marcela Uribe. I am a climate organizer for RISC. Um, I mean, I just came into the meeting, but I am very curious about uh, the mission and vision of this organization, like this group. And also, I mean, of course, um, just thinking about all these other issues that we are we have with climate change. I know this might like might not be ready for this type of conversation right now, but I was just going to say that. I mean, it would be interesting to like Melissa was saying. So, what is the main purpose of this group? And then uh, from there, some identify some objectives and a strategy and what what do you want to accomplish? So that would be also very interesting. And if, if someone like me can intersect with, that would be also very important as well. 
Well, thank you, Marcia, uh, very much. Uh, certainly, we'll keep all of that in mind for for the next meeting and uh, after, you know, during and after the for, for the next meeting. Um, we're almost to time here, uh, 2.30, uh, less than uh, just about six minutes away from closing out. Does anybody have any other questions, comments, or concerns? I, I think the feedback so far has been excellent. Uh, this is exactly what I was looking for uh, up to this meeting. Um, whereas the first meeting, again, was more of an informative meeting and an introductory meeting to just to, to sort of open up this project. This meeting has been very helpful in, uh, and, and, and guiding this, uh, helping me guide uh, the future of this uh, group. So uh, again, does anyone have any other questions or concerns, comments? No, okay. I, I think I see Virginia had something to say in the chat. Um, I was uh, just agreeing with Melissa that I think having like a Google form where people can tell us what they think about the name, the logo, the mission and the vision statement would give people more time to think this through. Excellent. No, great. Thank you for, for, for stating that, uh, Virginia. Um, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, uh, I'll once again, just ask if there's any other questions. If not, we can close out today's meeting uh, and uh, keep a lookout for our next meeting to be tentatively held uh, sometime in December uh, before the holidays. Um, that way everyone can attend. I know December tends to get very busy with family and friends, so we will make it a point to be uh, get together again before uh, early in the month before the holidays. If anyone has any questions uh, after the meeting, please always feel free to reach out to me. Um, our, our info is up on our website for this project. Um, my email as well is up on our website. And I uh, will download a list of all the stakeholders who had registered and attended today's meeting uh, from, uh, from our, uh, our, our, our platform so that we can follow up with each and every one of you uh, after the meeting is over. Um, Trisha, I don't know if you had anything else to just to say to close out today's meeting. I just think it was a great group. I think this is a dynamite group of people. Uh, we know a lot of y'all. We know you're passionate um, about about this type of work, and uh, it's an exciting time for not just risk but for Laredo as we really work to build a new water security program so that we can elbow our way to in these very critical decisions that get made about our river um, so that it's not just in the hands of upstream or downstream users or people in Austin or, or DC or Mexico City that we have a say um, in, 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 in how we envision the future of our river and our watershed. And we can't do this without you. And so we're just very grateful that you're on this call. We look forward to more dynamic conversations uh, um, you know, as they, as they arrive as in the, in the future. And hopefully we'll be able to gather at some point soon in person as well as, you know, I always say that's where magic happens uh, when it's in person um, or hybrid, however. So just thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you all very much for being with us here today. Um, at this time, I guess I'll go ahead and close out the meeting. Um, again, please feel free to reach out if you ever have any questions on this. I'll be very happy to share anything with you all. Um, thank you all again very much for attending. We hope to see you all soon in our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Victor.